What if you were told you had five days to live? What then? What would you do? How would you start to live or how would you start to die? Because somebody said that to me seven months ago, but I'm still standing. And if you want, I'll tell you how I did it. The meeting of me and Samaria is actually the beginning of the frame of the rest of our lives. Meeting. I, I literally, I can see it like it was yesterday, Don't, and it's 62 years ago. We've been together for more than 60 years. 2023, it's going to be 63 years. years. Where did it go? Lots of places. <laughs> And so when I was a young kind of teenager, I guess I was 18, Samari was 17. I needed to get from one place to another and my car had broken down. So this friend that was gonna pick me up to take me there came, but his car had broken down. <laughs> Go figure, see, this is everything working out in perfection. He brought his friend, Bears. I didn't know who she was. I was doing a favor for a friend of mine and driving her to her dad's home, and I said I would help out. He's driving, and it was in a car that had, you know, that used to have three seats in the front, like you could have, you could have the bench seat. So I was in the middle between Bear's driving and this friend of mine. So my friend and Samaria chatted away in the car. And I tried to engage Bear's in a discussion. It was like, mm-hmm, no, 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 literally. I was very present. No answering, no reaction facially. I could just think intense, uh, focused. Maybe one or two word answers. You know, the kind you can really be attracted to. <laughs> she was joy and smiles, and I was somber and difficult. And somehow we met in the middle. Ha! <laughs> I wasn't particularly attracted to him. He was only there for 15 minutes. Then we dropped this young girl to a house. We walked her to the door. We said goodbye. And then he left. Unbeknownst to me, I have no idea what came over me, but I said to my stepmom, see that boy walking away with my friend? That's the guy I'm gonna marry. I'm gonna marry him and spend the rest of my life with him. Now remember, 17 years old, what did I know? And I remember later when we used to talk about it, she said, it wasn't because you were gorgeous. I mean, truthfully, I was in love with every guy I met. <laughs> but this hit me like a ton of bricks and I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't tell you why. She said to me, I felt that my life was coming and greeting me. You may not even realize, as I didn't, how when things happen in your life, you don't know where it's going to lead. You never know. When he left, of course, he never contacted me again, but I had him in my head, after all. I'm going to marry him. <laughs> so I um, wrote a letter. About two days later, uh, three days later, I receive from Samaria a pink envelope. I've never gotten a pink envelope before. And I see her name on it and I open it up. And that's the first time she tells me, she said, I hope you're okay with this, but I'm going to marry you and spend the rest of my life with you. The letter just said, I, you know, I know you're going to laugh at this and it's going to sound crazy, but I mean, you know, like I was like that, uh, but just take this in. I'm going to marry you one day. <laughs> and actually, I remember this was like no other experience in my life. Anybody even say that anybody that would even care about me and think they want to spend time with me. So I didn't do anything. This is an example of you kind of make your own future. You kind of make your own experiences. You, if you don't do things that are out of your box, you know, you're just going to keep doing the things that are in your box and it's going to get boring. 
And then I got a phone call. She's pursuing it more. He answers the phone and I said, um, I don't know if you remember me. <laughs> well, first thing she said actually is, did you laugh when you got my letter? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 I did not laugh. I actually got pretty like, oh my God. He invites me to go out. So we go out and we danced. When I was in the car with her, and this is Samaria for her whole life with me, we're driving for about 20 minutes to go to a place where we're gonna have a, a bite to eat together. And I start with, listen, you don't wanna have a relationship with me. I am difficult. I am judgmental. I'm mad at the universe. And I think everything is not fair or just. Plus, I'm a writer and in the middle of writing a novel, even though I'm 18 years old, and, um, and I believe that all artists are really unhappy people. So you're gonna deal with an unhappy person who's judgmental. You don't want a relationship with a person like that. And the 17-year-old girl looks at me and says something like, I can handle that. It was like, again, God really feels right with this person, even though it hurt my neck too, because he was so much taller than me. <laughs> that began everything, of course. It was, this is undeniable. I learned so much from that 17-year-old girl who taught me how to smile, I never smiled, who taught me how to laugh, I never laughed. And ultimately, when we had children, taught me how to play. Because a serious guy like me, I didn't play. Love. Ha! <laughs> Three conceptual ingredients that we have about love. To love somebody is to deeply accept them and not judge them. <clears throat> Secondly is to want the best for them. And the third part is to do something about it and be useful to them. That completes the circle of love. It makes it digestible. It makes it doable. When I was growing up, love was like, it fell out of the sky yeah. and it hit you on the head. <laughs> and if it didn't hit you on the head, in quotes, you weren't lucky. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we teach love as an intention mm -hmm. and a verb, something you can do. So, we develop the early part of our relationship. We then do, as she suggested, we then got married. And for the next decade, two people who deeply loved each other were really two unhappy people. I was shy, insecure, down on myself, in every way. And here I was with a very, very strong male. And after a number of years, I, I just could not really function in the, in the relationship. But the relationship was really difficult for both of us, and that included while we were birthing our first two children. In other words, there was a lot of difficulty that we were having together. And I think the main part of what was difficult, and I, I really feel this way, is we were always blaming each other for our unhappiness. Well, why didn't you do that? Now I feel really uncomfortable with that. You made me uncomfortable. I didn't make you uncomfortable. Yes, you did. If you had done something else. And so what I was aware of, she was aware of, I was the most unhappy because remember, I was the sullen guy who thought injustice in the world and I thought injustice inside myself and I was kind of angry at the universe. She was so much more loving, but in terms of our interaction, it was difficult for both of us. He hit all my points that I had issues with and that's what I think all relationships are about. <laughs> it's like you're with somebody who's gonna press your buttons. <laughs> Get used to it. When it began to change is when we started to study about 
just the idea about beliefs. It was so transformative for us personally. We, we did it individually and you know, it wasn't about working on the relationship. It was about working on each of us ourselves. In graduate school, I was doing philosophy and psychology at the time, and I told people I was seeing a psychoanalyst as part of the school curriculum, but it wasn't quite true. I felt like I was so unhappy. I just wanted to be happier. So I'm doing sessions with this gentleman. He would sit behind me and about twice in every session, I'd hear him go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then he would lead me to the door at the end of the session. I said, listen, I've been doing this for a while. I'm still anxious, I'm still uncomfortable, I still get angry. And he said to me, but you're much better than you were last year or the year before. And you need to know that's part of the human condition. You will always be scared of things, but less scared. You will always get annoyed and angry at things, but you can get less angry and feel it more under your control. And I remember thinking at the time, if that's what you believe, I want something different. I want to find something so I can actually be happy. Not less miserable, but actually be happy. That's what I want to look for. He was taking these night classes. He would come home and over the next few months, I was seeing changes in him. And I was like, holy moly. And this is what I concluded. If he could change, <laughs> I could change. <laughs> because I believe that was like impossible. Because at that time, I kind of lived in a world where I believed in, and most other people on planet do, in stimulus response. Meaning, I get a letter, the letter has the power to freak me out. You tell me something that you don't like about me, and I say, you just made me unhappy by saying that. Versus now, in terms of option and sunrise program and things we teach, knowing no one has the power to do that. If I'm upset, I got myself upset. If I'm fearful, I scared myself. If I'm angry, I created anger inside of myself. And that knowledge gave us the ability not only to develop what we developed in terms of beliefs and teaching people worldwide, it gave us the ability to do something really so darn special which is to see our responsibility, but also to see the emancipation of that power. Oh, you think I'm a jerk and I get unhappy. Actually, you didn't make me unhappy. I decided you calling me a jerk was either bad for me or maybe you're right and I am a jerk. And then I got unhappy with my own beliefs and thoughts not with what you said. As I'm learning about beliefs, I have so many beliefs of I'm nothing. I'm not enough. I'm, I just lack fear of being judged and fear of being put down, fear of not being loved and fear of being left and fear, you know, everything that we're all taught. <laughs> I had them all. And of course, where he was at that time, he had his own issues. Because I was working at that time, the early part of our relationship in the motion picture industry. I was working for companies like United Artists, Paramount Pictures. People would say, you have such a romantic life. You're flying out next weekend to talk to Robert Redford. And I would say, really? I sold out and I would just beat the daylights out of myself. You sold out. You were going to change the world. Here you are in, a, in this glamorous universe that you don't even like. I just made it a really unhappy time for myself. So I had to learn how to um, acknowledge I was making me unhappy. And that's how I began uh, to unfold the intense beliefs I had. I started to go, you know, 
he sang something to me. I always just, I would always say, I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> and uh, I go in the bathroom and I said to myself, what are you gonna make this mean? What am I doing with what they're doing? <laughs> and where am I standing in myself where I start to see the beliefs I'm holding and how they are dysfunctional for me? And when we first started to change our relationship, it's when each of us did something special as a result of that. Just remember we have the stimulus, remember we have this belief, and then from my belief, I always have my beliefs, that's my lens and my filter, I create my responses. And we got to a point where we both stopped pointing at each other and we would point the finger back. And when we started to take, I guess I would use this expression, ownership, stop blaming the other person. Then our relationship started to change, I must say, slowly, but in essence, profoundly, because we weren't pointing at each other anymore. And so if I was angry, I'd say, I'm really angry. Why am I getting myself angry? Using questions to understand our beliefs. But in order to do that, you have to keep either getting someone ask, to ask you questions or asking yourself questions. I used to walk around constantly talking out loud to myself. Okay, what about that? What are you doing with that? Why are you feeling that way when, you know? <laughs> and that led to more and more, what's going on with you? What, what, you know, why did you say that to me? What, what were you wanting? What were you thinking? What, you know, more questions back and forth which led to more understanding of the other person. And of course, deeply of ourselves. This is priceless for our lives. If you want to get out of the rut, you just have to go inside. It began with changing one belief. We realized that when we change a belief, we opened ourselves to a really different embrace of the world so where so much of it before had to do with being in turmoil and really having difficulties now there was a lot more ease not perfectly and a lot more joy maybe still imperfectly as we were growing but when you change your beliefs everything changes everything about your life everything about what you felt everything about how you choose to be changes because you're coming from a different center inside of yourself. But this center is not something you purchased in a department store and you took it off the rack. This is you custom designing yourself based upon how you want to live and what you want to experience. I used everything from that moment on to grow myself into a full and comfortable human being. As we started to learn about our beliefs, I have to tell you, it was like someone gave me a vat of ice cream. <laughs> Samaria and I did it together. And from that point, that was 10 years into our relationship. And then we started to bond and create a level of understanding and a level of love imperfectly as that was, to get to a point where when I think of Samaria and I think of the Institute and all the people we have worked with from all around the world and in different parts of the world, and the children that we birthed and the children that we adopted and the grandchildren that we have, it is so beautiful but there is nothing to me that is more beautiful than that woman who is my wife and who is my partner and who is my lover and who is my playmate <laughs> and has showed up for me as we got better and better at it as sunshine and really brought a level of camaraderie and peace that I've created in her presence that is 
nothing I ever imagined I would ever be able to do in my life. I would have bet my children he couldn't have changed like this. He has transformed himself in so many ways. And I have transformed myself in so many ways. Thank you for changing, Bobby. <laughs> Thank you for hanging out with me for decade after decade after decade after decade. It's, it's kind of like hard to conceptualize. I feel so close to you. Yeah. And I feel that we are so loving and supportive with each other, but more than ever. Yeah. So if I imagine yeah. how I could love you a year ago, mm -hmm. I love you more than ever. Mm -hmm. And you have shown up for me mm -hmm. all the time. What I know is, and here's my line, this is my abiding line. You cannot go wrong in your life with this one line, with this one belief. The one who loves the most wins. <laughs> wins. And the way to do that is to love yourself first. Because it's not about what you're going to get from the person. It's what you're giving yourself when you love somebody. That's what matters. The one who loves the most wins. Got it, Poppy. <laughs> <laughs>
we would not do what everybody else around the planet was doing. And so we decided we would create our own program based on this attitude that we we're already working with of not judging, based on the concept of prioritizing love, based on really being accepting and inclusive rather than pushing away in some way, we embraced autism. That autism was something of a gift and a blessing, but it was up to us to find the blessing. So, you know, we start to grow a strong belief that whatever is happening is happening to benefit us. Everything is perfect for you. It is happening for you. And I knew that that boy, my son, was happening for us. We didn't know what was in the future. Believe me, it wasn't because we even said, oh, he will come out of autism or he will change or he will this and he will that. No, we didn't even do that. We just went day by day. And this started all with Samaria, that we would work with Ron. If you want to understand him, let's go to his world. So that began the whole process of joining. And so rather than trying to stop him from rocking, let's rock with him. Rather than trying to stop him from doing this, let's do it with him. And those were the beginning of the Sunrise program. And it was the beginning of actually creating connectivity with Ron that we didn't have before. So when Samari would spend these endless creative hours at the beginning when we started the program, she would just delight in that kid. And I just started to interact with Ron. I started to tell him, you know, you don't have to change anything. You don't have to look at me if you don't want I me. Mean, he never looked, he never, he never had a single reaction to anything. And, and so I just kept on presenting. So I would take a block, I put it in front of him. And he would just not look at me, of course, at all, grab the block and just throw it. So I kept doing block on, he kept throwing it, block on, throwing, until I stopped and I said, all right, you wanna throw the blocks? We're gonna really throw the blocks. I took the whole box of, of blocks and started throwing it all around the room. All of a sudden I stopped right in the middle and he's looking at me for the first time, for the first time. And I went, oh my God, Ron, I got it. I understand. I'm, I'm joining you where you are. And that is doing something to help you want to look at me. Children with autism are fantastic. They're like a blessing in the world. They are extraordinarily unusual they come in with a whole set of neurological frameworks that are different than ours. And so when we watch children with autism, a lot of times they have something called stims or isms, which are rituals. Might be flipping their fingers beside, it might be like Ron rocking back and forth or with Ron spinning plates. And I remember I did so many different things with Ron, but I remember one of my favorite things with Ron was, he used to love flushing the toilet. And when he would flush the toilet, he would like spin like this, flip his hands as the water would go down. And I remember, because we were joining him, I was gonna do that with him. And we would both watch the water go down and we'd watch it going around and around and down. And then I started to realize after about seven flushes that I started to feel really peaceful and calm. And that actually his behaviors on the outside was his way of creating peace and comfort on the inside. It was almost as if he was doing a meditation, but in a very unusual way. And so when people thought to try to stop the child on the autism spectrum from doing their thing, it's you're stopping them from using their own wisdom to create their own peace. And if you allow them to do that, their accessibility to be open to us is 
really, really super enhanced. Uh, eventually, after, I don't know, six months to a year, we started to incorporate people into the program of working with Ron by training them to see, what, see how we see. We talk about seeing through sunrise eyes, which is total acceptance and understanding and passion and an exuberance for whatever the child is doing. So Ron would be rocking back and forth and I'd be rocking back and forth and I'd be delighting in rocking back and forth. And all of a sudden, you know, a little, you know, a little glance and I'd go, oh, that was so amazing. You just looked at me and I would just be in that space of enjoying my child and not judging difference. Because their world is hard to digest. They're trying to make it easy to digest and everybody on the planet is trying to stop them rather than saying, yes, you're okay. Yes, thank you. Yes, be what you want. I'm coming with you for two reasons. I want to understand you. The second reason is equally important. I want you to know I accept you. I want you to feel safe with me. And the way that I can best do that, which we did with Ron, the first child, besides the thousands and thousands have done through the years, is really create connectivity. Well, of course, his first word was really, really meaningful to me because it was a word. <laughs> you know, it was wah for water. And so we all jumped up, we got him water, clearly he said his first word, and clearly it was water, and everybody in the house went wild. Like, oh my God, Ron said, ha, ha, after months. And maybe in somebody else's family, we would go, that's it, it's the beginning. So we worked with Ron, as I said, for three years, and he, I, I, I mean, the tears would just come down my cheeks. Just each step was like a gift and or, or like, I don't know if he's gonna go one more step or not. Little by little, we crossed the bridge to him and little by little he took many steps. They were almost invisible at the beginning. Step towards us. If you could imagine having a little boy who's your son, who you care about, who you really love, and he's been with you for a year and two years, and he's never looked at you, never smiled, never really hugged you, never went to touch and cling to your hand. And suddenly one day you're working with him and you haven't seen him look at you for two years. And suddenly he looks right into your eyes and he starts to smile. Well, it's like the most beautiful thing. It's like watching the universe open up in front of you. In three years, we worked 12 hours a day, 75 hours a week. And he went from that to a little boy now who functions on a near genius level, who talks, is communicative, is loving. Ron now, I mean, he obviously uh, went from, you know, a nonverbal person to a super verbal person. He went from a person who you couldn't even touch to a person who became very affectionate. He ultimately graduated high school really at the top of his class and graduated high honors and then graduated from an Ivy League university and now writes books and teaches all around the world, married, etc. We weren't thinking about that in the first Sunrise program. All we wanted to accomplish is for him to somehow know, because he was so disconnected and so encapsulated with himself, for him to know that he was loved. And then Bears, first he wrote an article about it that appeared in New York Magazine, so he got his writing in. And then it was picked up by many different uh, publishers for a book. And after that, I wrote a book. The book was called Sunrise. It became a bestseller at the time. Then there was a movie made called Sunrise, A Miracle of Love, which has did super well because it was put in the press and it got into the media. They had like many millions more people watch the movie. People started, once I wrote the book, to call us, write us, and ask, wow, if you've been able to do that with your son, 
can you help me help my son? Can you help me help my daughter? And then we would say things like, yes, we'll do the best we can. How can we help you? We took one person at a time. And so for the next couple of years, we worked with people. We never charged any, anybody any money to just see if we can help them with their attitudes and help them with their children. And that really birthed not only the Option Institute, not only the Autism Treatment Center of America, but it forced us in a beautiful way to qualify and quantify every aspect of the Sunrise program so that we could teach it. We did it. Now we have to figure out how can we help them? Because we haven't ever done this before. Uh, but we know where to start. We know where to begin in ourselves. We know how to be accepting and loving and uh, persistent, that's for sure. <laughs> it always began with attitude. It always began with beliefs. So we were really good at that. Barry and Susie, do you think other parents of autistic children can do what you did? Yes, we believe that's true. And we're writing a book on it. And we're also going to start a school to help other parents do what we did. To show them. To show them, the to same. teach them, to instruct them if they're wanting to. You feel very proud of yourselves. You want to. I feel excited. Mm. Excited about the possibilities for other children too. We could explain it so that somebody not only could have confidence, I could do this with my child, but also to be able to deliver. And so that was a wonderful sort of opportunity for us because people kept coming from all over the country and all over the world. We had this family from um, uh, Mexico that came and stayed for a, for a good long time where we, we collected a crew of people, trained the crew of people. They only spoke Spanish, so we had to learn Spanish <laughs> to do it and um, worked with him like we worked with Ron. I said, okay, we'll spend three months working with you in the same process. We'll develop a whole staff of volunteers, high school and college students, and we'll give your child every possible chance. We had an EEG done on him. The physician said, listen, I have proof the boy has brain damage in the left frontal lobes. He will never talk, he will never speak. Mm. And therefore, why are you wasting your time? And I said, perhaps the difference between you and us is that we don't have to know that we're going to succeed. We celebrate the trying, and you always have to believe you're going to get where you're going. How do you know? If you believe you can't get there, you don't try, and that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We're going to at least try. And that's celebrate the trying. That's celebrate the trying. Part of the story of the rebirth of Robotito is also the continued story of our once autistic child, Ron, because Ron becomes a teacher for Robotito with us as well. I remember one time when he realized the whole family was involved with Robotito. He said, Daddy, could I be one of the teachers too? And I said, I don't know, Ron, we'll see. He said, but, but I really want to. And I said, well, why do you want to? He said, because, Daddy, I know three languages and you only know two. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you know big people language. And I said, yes, talking to adults. He says, you know small people language. Yes, talking to children. He says, yeah, but I know autistic language and nobody else knows that. And I said, kid, you're hired. Hmm. And, and he became part of the program in order. In some way, he now extended a hand to another child lost in darkness and brought him from behind the what wall. What was that first meeting like with, with Ron and Robertito? I can tell you a key meeting that was real special. We had not developed eye contact. And just, just to frame it, Robotito ultimately talked and rode bicycles and did mathematics and did everything everybody said was in how possible. Long? In about a year and a half. Our three months turned into a year and a half. One time when Ron was first working with Robotito and moving with him and doing the different self-stimulating behaviors, suddenly Robotito sat down and Ron sat, and Ron at that time was five and a half years old. And all of a sudden Robotito started looking at him and they looked at each other. It was their first sustained eye contact and it went on for almost a minute. And Susie are inside of the room going, oh, we can't believe it. We're clocking it and writing. And suddenly. That's really exciting. Oh, it was so incredible because he hadn't looked at another human being in six years. And all of a sudden, Ron turns to us like deadpan, and he's five and a half, and he says, we're telling the truth to each other. We do it with our eyes. And then he turned back and continued his staring session with this little boy. We really special stuff. Real special. And over the years, the Sunrise program has helped thousands of families and children all over the world, including our own precious and beautiful granddaughter, Jade, 
who just like Ron, believe it or not, was on the autism spectrum. Her amazing parents, our daughter Bryn and her husband William, designed and ran a sunrise program for her, of course. And after five passionate, dedicated years, she fully emerged from her own world to join us in ours. So life keeps giving us stuff and we say, bring it on. If we do a bring it on, everything changes. So we teach people to love. We teach people to have purpose. We teach people to be present. We teach people to be non-judgmental. I think Ron was the biggest opportunity for us to put that into action in our lives and to really get the point if we believe that happiness and love is in the present moment, this little kid is giving you a chance to actually do it. Love them now. Be kind to them now. Help them in whatever way you could think of now. It's not about tomorrow and it's nothing about what was. It's about doing that now. We didn't know that he was coming in the future. But if we hadn't done what we did first, which is to look at our judgments, to look at our beliefs, if we hadn't done that first, we couldn't have greeted him mm -hmm. with a smile and looked at him mm -hmm. like he's a blessing. Mm -hmm. Because the realization was we had done all this prep work for him what we were teaching ourselves now and what we had learned could literally take us anywhere. I like the idea of inviting people in. Because we started to work with one family at a time. And groups of friends of ours, and we'd work with them literally in the rooms of our house where we lived. We would go for walks and I started to bring up to bears. Let's find a place where people could come and we could help them, but the environment of the attitude is 24-7. And I said, what do you think if we started an institute? So from the spark of changing our beliefs and the joy and wonder of the first Sunrise program with Ron, we actually further developed questions and further developed a way to understand them for ourselves and to be able to ultimately share it with other people. We started to talk about having an institute. Every detail, because he then got on board for that. We then together started to brainstorm all kinds of ideas. Because so many people had read my books and there were millions of copies in circulation, as soon as we decided to do that, so many people said, I want to come, I want to come, I want to help, I want to come, I want to help. So it seemed like an easy, natural evolution. People were inspired to come and help themselves and learn this whole process, the option process that we, we teach. When we started the Institute, which took us six years to find, we went everywhere. We even took a, a summer trip across the country to see maybe we were supposed to be in another part of the country or the world. We came back to the East Coast and in the newspaper, a teeny tiny little ad in the paper was advertising this place. I was reading, you know, like the Sunday Times and I brought it to Bears and I say, I cut this out. See this little ad? This is our place. I mean, it's, it's one of those again. We can, if we're not afraid of looking stupid or weird, we can say these things because it's there. Knowledge is there. We are more, more, more aware than we ever give ourselves credit for. Six years, we went all around. Then we find this and we drive up, we look off and we look at each other and we said, this is our heaven. This is it. This is our place. Now. We didn't know how we could pay for it. <laughs> it took enormous 15 hour days for a long time for us to start the Institute. 
Once we started, the volunteers were great. They became like, we all became family to each other. It felt in some way we were all in college together. People slept in dorm areas. They slept on the floor. Uh, we all worked together. We were all very motivated. And we trained those volunteers who ultimately became staff and taught them how to help people. And the marvelous thing is in order to train them, we had to figure out how to do that. <laughs> like. How do you train somebody for this? We knew about the Sunrise program because we had honed that so well. Now we were talking about, because Sunrise sits on the platform of the attitude of the option process, how do we teach them that? Here's how it went. We decided, I was really smart in this, I'm really proud of myself. I said, you know, it's gonna work better if we each take our own areas. <laughs> so he was gonna take the adult programs, I was going to do the Sunrise programs. I taught the adult programs, which were the option programs. Samaria taught the Sunrise programs, and we also helped each other in both areas. And so we did programs that were one week, four weeks, and eight weeks long. I would come into class every day. I would actually give them, I guess what we'd call a lecture, on a framework, and then also create activities around the framework. But it was all one day at a time which in some way kind of reminded me of the Sunrise Program with Ron. Because we trusted ourselves to go in a room with these people. We knew what there was that we were gonna teach. We want the subject of what we're teaching to define the way we teach it, like self-trust, or how to be calm amid chaos, how to be fearless, to deal with fears, etc. So we put them into more defined categories. And that's how this became a process that we now have utilized for more than 40 years in every area with every challenge. I, every day, I'd have um, family coming, you know, uh, parents and a child, and involve myself with the child and do different things and show them things and teach them about how to be with their child. That um, got so many families to really help themselves help their child uh, because they can't really help their child if they don't help themselves. And so we started to see thousands of people, literally over these all these years, 40 years, of unbelievable experiences that they gave themselves by first taking care of their own attitudes and then being there in such an amazing way for their children, with their children. And so this was just ex expanding. People were, were coming and volunteering and, and it was magical. In the early days of the Institute, for me and Samaria, for our staff and for the board of directors, everybody was on board to do whatever it takes. We'll do whatever it takes. Yeah. And I wanna give you two examples of that. We are having a new program and there's a new building just built. <laughs> we have a board meeting that evening. We take four or five vehicles. We shine the headlights <laughs> on the vehicles onto the building. And while we're having the board meeting, every board member <laughs> has a paintbrush <laughs> and we are staining the side of one of the, the, one of, one of the buildings while we're doing it. And then, <laughs> We go upstairs because we don't have much staff. Mm. This is the board members. And we start to make the beds because <laughs> we had nobody to make the beds while we're chatting away mm. about whatever the board meeting issues are. And it didn't seem weird. unusual or weird. <laughs> yeah. It felt like, oh, that's the next uh. place. We love what we're doing. We want to make it work. Stay in the building while we have a board meeting. I didn't just have the Institute and create an additional building. No, we had to build 13 <laughs> additional buildings. And I decided that his, a, a big belief he has is anything worth doing is worth overdoing. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't hard. That was, that's the important thing to know, it is that when you, once you really want something different and create a different uh, belief about it, you're in like Flynn. It's, it's like clear sailing. Absolutely. Because you've created a sort of smooth runway 
to take off in. <laughs> we worked day and night for years and years and years. Uh, it's just like, because there was so much to handle, it's just another opportunity to see our own power. The things we can do with what they say can't be done. And over the decades, I think it's been more than four decades, so it's more than 40 years, we have had over 45,000 people come from all around the world on this particular campus here in Massachusetts and work with them in person. We've also worked with people around the globe. And now we offer online courses worldwide on Zoom and other digital platforms. And it's been the most heartwarming experience. It reminds me of my family. My family is, um, is a combination of some birth children, lots of adopted children. So our family is the world. We have all different races and religions, etc. That's the Option Institute. I see people from different countries. We had people here from Israel and from Palestine who just learned to love each other. We had people when there was turmoil in Northern Ireland, different parts of Ireland, come to meet and greet each other. We had people from warring fractions in Sudan that when they sat in these room and when the intention was to be accepting of each other, they did it. It was kind of magical. I would go into the mountain house, uh, which is the place, the dining hall here at the Option Institute and the Autism Treatment Center of America. And I just saw all different kinds of people chatting, talking and loving. And I was thinking, you know what? We're teaching world peace. We're teaching people to embrace and not see people as others, but see people as family. We then also decided, okay, you know, we want to adopt some kids. So decided to go to Colombia, and uh, we took this one kid who was had been left in the forest at under on nine months and just left there and they he was saved brought to an orphanage and that was you know our child we went down there and literally worked with the whole orphanage <laughs> oh, you know there there's just no stopping what we wanted to and they got so much help and they changed their ways with the children and you know stopped yelling at them and all these different things. So it's like when we learn something for ourselves, we can then share it with others. And that's a beautiful thing. That is, that's like a natural way of uh, expanding in your universe that you have in your life. There's all kinds of people that you're there to support and love. That was the first child we adopted. The second child we adopted, they contacted us would you be willing to take this child? Because his mother had died when he was about three, he's five now, and he was living with his father in a very, very, very poor area where they hardly had any food. And one day his father was cutting plantanos, bananas, and he was so, so hungry and he said to his father, like this little five-year-old, can I have one? His father got so angry with him that he took a knife and slit his throat twice and left him for dead. I mean, these are the situations we are welcoming into our life, you know. He is now, you know, he has uh, three kids and they are awesome. You know, he's, he's, he's made a life for himself that is so great and just feeling so proud of him for doing that for himself, you know. So this is really about creating an environment where we all feel safe, which is with love and acceptance and then perseverance about it and not giving up and trusting even when you don't know what to do next, you will. Now that third one, Bears was teaching a class and in the break, one of the participants walked up to him and said, hey Bears, would you guys be interested in uh, adopting a little girl from El Salvador? because she's going to be thrown out into the streets. And he said, oh yeah, we would adopt her. 
11 years old. And she said, well, don't you have to check with Samaria? <laughs> and he said, oh, no, she'll be fine with it. <laughs> so, you know, there it was. We welcomed it, the other kids, when she was there for a while, came to us and said, can we send her back? <laughs> and we said, well, how would you like it if we sent you back? You know, <laughs> anyway, we didn't send her back. I can't even put words to how much she helps me in my life. How about if you really started with, it is all perfect for us, for we don't know what, and we can be benefited by it, even and especially by challenges. Our daughter Bryn and her husband William, who is like a son to us, and our son Ron also joined the staff and became dedicated and gifted teachers, as well as pillars of the Institute for the decades that they worked there. Other staff who worked for this organization for close to 30 years became dear family members to us. What we're teaching, which we call option process, we've actually become extraordinary optimists. To believe, it's a belief, that in any circumstance, you can extract a learning and a blessing. When I taught in this room, when I would come into this room, I would know that in the room are people from all around the world, actually from 120 different countries. And I would know that they're all here wanting help. So whether they're wanting help with their own traumas or their own process, if we're doing kind of adult option process courses, or they're wanting help, which is a huge part of our whole lives, with their children on the autism spectrum. I feel that no matter what we do in this room, there are no wrong moves. Absolutely no wrong. There's no wrong moves for any of us in our lives, but we have to learn to absorb that kind of concept. But the fascinating part for me is nobody in the room can make a wrong move. So if somebody falls asleep, they fall asleep. If somebody stands up and jumps and starts to cheer, <laughs> that's all part of the process and part of the program. And that sensibility, because I've taught thousands of classes, has grown. And I always have two thoughts before I open the door from the green room into the big room here, the big conference room. Love first, talk second. Love first, act second. And when I walk into this room, it's always love first, talk second, love first, act second. I've created my beliefs between the stimulus and what I'm doing, beliefs that I wanna use every moment when I'm teaching somebody, I wanna <laughs> use every moment when I'm working with people in large groups or seminars and classes to use for their benefit. So I have a continuous belief, which is, there's no wrong moves. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna always be doing the best I can. Mm -hmm. And it's me and a benevolent universe. <laughs> yeah. That's, which is a belief. Which is a belief. <laughs> it's me and the benevolent universe right. that are in this room together on purpose. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. This is my film, the you. <laughs> this is Poppy, <laughs> supposed to be dead. Louder. Poppy, <laughs> this is Poppy walking, speed walking. <laughs> what if you were told you had five days to live? What then? What would you do? How would you start to live or how would you start to die? Because somebody said that to me seven months ago, but I'm still standing mm -hmm. and I'm in front of you and I'm called a medical mystery with a miraculous outcome. And if you want, I'll tell you how I did it, but I want to tell you too, it doesn't mean I'll be teaching tomorrow because mm -hmm. maybe tomorrow I will die 
but I didn't die seven months ago. And I'm laughing. I'll tell you why I'm laughing. Because when we heard what was happening for me, my amazing life partner didn't scare himself. I didn't scare myself. We took what was seemingly indigestible information, but I was also sick and I was in a lot of pain and I couldn't move very well. We took it and we said, whatever is next, we're going to embrace it. We want to teach you whatever is next for you to embrace it. It could be somebody you love doesn't want to talk to you anymore. It could be a job that you're just fascinated with and they just fired you. Or it could be a job that you want and they don't want you to be able to take that information and actually grow yourself bigger, grow yourself happier, grow yourself in a way more confident. Because it's not about the events around you that matter. It's about what you do and make believe about the events around you. It's the beliefs and help you work with that. I was thinking that even when I was in hospice mm -hmm. half a year ago, mm -hmm. and even though we were both embracing that I was seemingly dying at that time, mm -hmm. the biggest thing we made real for us is yeah. loving each other. Just loving each other. I just received an email last night, and then somebody said, I can't believe you're doing so well, and I know other people are thinking maybe you're fighting cancer so well, but I was imagining you in Samaria loving your cancer cells. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly mm -hmm. what we did. Mm -hmm. We loved them and we said, anytime you're ready to go, we have an, exit. Ready, we have an exit plan for right, you, right. <laughs> but we're, we're not at all making war with you, we're making love with you. About a half a year ago, I was hospitalized. Nobody could understand what was wrong with me because two weeks before that, I had had a wellness checkup. As an 80-year-old person, they said I was the best, most healthiest person they've ever seen. Two weeks later, I had difficulty getting out of bed. I started to not be able to think well. I was taken to a hospital by ambulance and then to another hospital where they said, I had metastatic stage four cancer throughout parts of my body, in my bones and in a core here, and also uh, in my liver and other areas. They also felt that in their analysis immediately, my kidneys were failing, so I had renal failure as well. They thought in the way that I was talking and speaking uh, that I probably had a stroke as well. <laughs> and they told my family, I ain't gonna ever get out of this hospital alive. Since I was so unusually disabled in terms of my ability to operate or even talk or move, I had something called hypercalcemia, which is not unusual if you have massive metastatic cancer in your body, it, it blows out your calcium system. So in effect, they put me in a bed. They did something else which was very unique. They tied my hands to the side of the beds. So now I felt like, oh my God, I'm being captured. Samaria comes immediately. My kids are there. They were wonderful. My kids showed up in the most wonderful way, but some of them are crying at different times. Poppy is dying. You know, we have to deal with it. And then one of them says to Samaria, it's okay to cry. And Samaria says, I didn't come here to cry. I came here to help your father, and I'm actually here to live what I've been teaching my whole life. It's like my whole life is for this next moment. After all these years of training myself, it was for that moment. That moment that I could look that straight in the eye and not freak out and not feel sorry for him or myself, and not worry about the future, and not scare myself. This is what is possible for us. She comes to my bedside. She's sunshine. 
She's ease in her face. She's relaxed. She's loving of me. And she was like a rock. She was love and ease and comfort. He said, I want out of the hospital. They got me out of the hospital. I said, I'd rather die in the back seat of my car getting driven home than in the hospital. And then we got him out. We, he said, save me from this, get me out of here. They said, okay, they got me out of the hospital, but I was told when I left, you have about five days to five weeks to live because you are so sick and there's nothing we can do to help you. We can't even give you any treatment if we wanted to. And so essentially I came home to hospice. Decision after decision on what to do with this. Okay, now how do we get the nurses to do that or the doctors to approve that or this to change or have them help him or things like that. Just one foot in front of the other. And basically, Samari and I immediately embraced me dying. We didn't fight it. We didn't feel bad about it. We were gonna say, okay, if we got five days, let's make it the most beautiful days of our lives. She was so amazing. I cannot believe how I can go through, I'm just talking about myself now, the news, the experience, the challenge of him suffering. He had five, was given five days to five weeks to live, all of this, and I, I didn't feel bad. I'm, I'm shocked by it. What I'm shocked at is that we can do this. That gave me an opportunity to really continue to put into practice everything we've been teaching our whole lives and to use those principles to help me still be here to talk to you five or six months later. So we come home, we go into hospice. Everybody, my kids are planning for me to die within five days to five weeks. I'm two weeks into hospice and I have this dull moment. And I come to the hospice people and I say, Thank you so much for helping me or wanting to help me. I was actually kind of wheeled in in a wheelchair because I couldn't really walk and move at that time and I was in a lot of pain. And I said, I realized I've been co-conspiring with you for me to die. And my dumb moment was, why can't I see if I can design myself to live? Even though everybody thinks I'm going to die, I should be dying, I'd like to design myself to live. He then decided he was gonna live after we, we got uh, hospice all lined up and doing all, look at that. Now, change of, change of action. <laughs> We're going in this direction now. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, I basically changed everything about my life. First, I had my kids help me learn how to walk again, help me to be able to stand and hold up my head. I started to verbalize the things I want. I, I felt really mentally clear, although my body wasn't coming along with me at the beginning. And I decided that I was gonna do everything I could to live. I started to become aware after we decided to let the hospice people go and help the people that were more looking like they were dying next week. And I decided I was gonna live more next week. I didn't do just one thing. We didn't do just one thing. Attitude was so important. The attitude of acceptance, the attitude of not judging, the attitude of loving, that became primary. Don't fight the parts of your body that seem to be in distress, if they're in distress. Don't fight the cells in your body that seem to be different than your traditional cells. The whole idea is, Rather than look at that and go, oh my God, that's terrible. Let's open our arms to it. Next was really living our lives as we've always taught people to do as best they can, especially with special children, is to be in the present. So we never thought about, am I gonna be alive in the afternoon? Am I gonna be alive in the evening? All we thought about, we have this minute and this hour, and we're gonna stay very, very, very present. The next part of it is purpose. Mm -hmm. We felt we needed to have clear purpose. Yes. And I think I teach something called the force of nature, which has to do with purpose, to have clear purpose. When you get up in the morning, why'd you get up in the morning? When you struggle to stand, it, at one point I did struggle to stand. Yeah. Uh, why am I standing? 
What's the purpose of that? What do I want to achieve? The next is we did, and we're continuing to do it, the most kind of strange diet. It's kind of a, a keto diet on steroids, which that means I eat bones of cows, I eat no carbs, I eat enough vegetables to drown me in <laughs> all the time, every day. Yeah. And then I'm eating a lot of fats. I also eat a lot of mushrooms. I also eat a lot of sauerkraut. I also eat a lot of crystallized vitamin C. Mm -hmm. So I have all these different combinations of things that I put together <clears throat> in terms of food. Then I have a place around my house that it's a kind of a parking area. And so I finally got out with a walker and walked once around it. Then the next day and the next day and the next day, I kept working at it. One of my sons helped me with it. And then I started to walk without the walker. And then I did two laps and three laps and four laps. And now every morning I do 56 laps. <laughs> robustly alive, robustly alive. Robustly and robustly alive. Vividly. Wow, we're alive and we're excited that we're alive. It's amazing. And then I exercise. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of a multifaceted thing. People write me and they say, I pray for you every day. And we do prayers because mm -hmm. I'm so grateful because there are thousands of people that chose to love me in Samaria. They said my liver was full of uh, metastases. Then they said in one of the scans and biopsy, oh, your liver seems to be healing now. Oh, something else is happening. But you need to go into chemotherapy right now. And then it had been three or four weeks and I was getting better and better. And I said, hey, listen, I'm doing better and better. Why would I want to do chemotherapy? Yes, I'm going to get pretty sick and uncomfortable. I feel really good. And even if my life is not going to be that long, I'm so excited. I'm feeling better and better. And now it's been almost the seventh month mark. They did scans and they said, my gosh, your liver seems clear. It has some lesions in, but no cancer. Uh, all the lesions in the rest of your part of your body look like things are being reduced by 50%. One of the doctors at Mass General said that you, with your positive attitude, with your perseverance and dedication and your energy, you are, in quotes, our miracle man, because we cannot explain how you're doing so well since that hospitalization with absolutely no medical intervention, no chemotherapy. I feel stronger. <laughs> I always feel stronger, smarter, and clearer than ever. The whole thing with greeting this as it's happening is to, because what's our first sort of propensity? It's what pill can I take? What, um, what can they give to me and put me through? And when we talk about attitude, you know, people want to roll their eyes. As if, oh yeah, there's a foo-foo, foo-foo language. <laughs> but it's not because it it's like recreating the inside of your body, your nervous systems and all the other systems, putting them at work with, surrounded by trust and love and belief in them. Like belief in whatever you are wanting for yourself. Beliefs are so central to how we live and what we feel and what we do. Beliefs don't exist kind of as an airy fairy thing happening sort of outside of us. A belief is actually a physical event that happens within our body. Our belief is biochemical. Our belief is electromagnetic. Our belief has neurotransmitters in it. If I cry mm -hmm. because I'm sad, and then I cry because I'm happy and grateful, the biochemistry in those tears will be different. And they will mimic the different biochemistry that's happening in our body. That we're and creating. Absolutely. And so the important point is, hey, listen, the beliefs and the feelings, the love and the hate, mm -hmm. the caring and the indifference. 
yeah. actually creates in ourselves body chemistry. Right. Which mm -hmm. is great. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we're thinking about healing ourselves, what we believe will have an impact. Mm -hmm. If we believe this is terrible, mm. we're actually going to create biochemistry in the body that's going to support maybe a problematic outcome. If we think this is an opportunity to learn, to grow, to heal, then we're giving messages literally on a cellular level to our body to heal. It's been amazing. It's been so amazing. We have even deepened even further our relationship, um, not through fear or worry about not being there, but through opening more and more. And uh, I just so madly in love with him. I can't mm. even, there aren't words, there aren't even songs, and there aren't poems enough to, to tell you how much I love this man. And uh, I feel loved by him. And uh, I never thought I'd get that. I never thought it would ever happen. So I'm very grateful to him for that. And I'm grateful to me for not needing that anymore. <laughs> when I looked as apparent like I was going to die, you were the rock, man. Yeah. <laughs> you were just, you were mm. so amazing. And when I think about how amazing you were, and when I have these tears, they're kind of tears of, I feel so grateful for you. I feel so grateful that you were still there with me and that you could process what was so difficult for you. You were about to lose your decades and decades old relationship with your husband. That wasn't on your mind. Your mind was, how do you help me? Your mind was when you looked over the hospital bed with me tied up, Yeah, you smiled. Mm -hmm. You looked confident. Mm -hmm. You thought we we're gonna get through it, even if that meant I mm -hmm. was gonna be dying. Mm -hmm. And you've become such a powerful, steadfast force of nature. So different from the 17-year-old, yeah. you know? Yes. So different. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> thank oh, God. I should say thank me. <laughs> <laughs> I like that better. <laughs>
I'm uh-huh.